Hi there, I'm Dr. Eugene O'Loughlin and welcome to this lesson on problem solving techniques. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at flowcharts. So what are our objectives for this lesson? At the end of the lesson, you should be able to do the following. First of all, define what is meant by a flowchart, then know when we should use a flowchart, and we can use four basic symbols to draw a simple basic flowchart. Finally, we want to, in this lesson, use a flowchart to identify possible areas for process improvement and, of course, to solve problems. Flowcharts are part of our process identification section four in our curriculum, and within this section we have two techniques, and the first of these are the flowcharts. Now, as always with our lessons, let's start off with a quotation. This one comes from Norman Peale, who was an author best known for popularizing popularizing the concept of positive thinking. And he once said, when a problem comes along, study it until you're completely knowledgeable. Then find that weak spot. Break the problem apart and the rest will be easy. So good inspirational stuff there from, from Norman Peale, uh, basically telling us to be persistent and start to look at the detail of the problems and that should make our task easier. So what is a flowchart? Flowcharts are diagrams that illustrate the sequence of operations to be performed to get to the solution of a problem. So therefore, it's a, they are good, useful tools for us as problem solvers uh, to help us get to a solution. And a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, flowcharts are first used by uh, this gentleman here on the right-hand side, Frank Bunker Gilbreth. He was an American engineer and an author known as a pioneer of time and motion study. But the little bit of trivia is he's probably perhaps better known as the father and central figure uh, of the cheaper by the dozen book and movie that you may be familiar with. And anyway, let's continue. Flowcharts are very effective in determining how a process works prior to improvement. So we've got a problem. Uh, we want to, something's not working to its capacity or at its best or there are errors occurring. How do we improve it? And the flowchart is a great tool for giving us what I call an at-a-glance approach to a problem. So what, when do we use flowcharts? We want to use them for quite a variety of things. We want to see, easily see things like the flow of information and materials. That's the best uh, use of a flowchart and what they're most popularly used for. We can also figure, use them to figure out the number of steps in a process and also things like branches in a process. We'll see later on uh, how decisions are made in a flowchart. Um, are there opportunities for infinite loops or processes going nowhere? And we will see that in our example as well later on. And they're also very useful for looking at interdepartmental operations. And of course, there are lots and lots of more uses as well. This is just a few of them. They can and often do show up badly organized flows and therefore help clarify improvement opportunities. So a flow chart uh, may already exist for a process. You mightn't have to draw one yourself, but if there's one existing, well then compare it to what's actually happening. Uh, or if you need to draw your flow chart up yourself, you might find uh, improvement opportunities. We can also use them to highlight problem areas where no procedure exists to cope with some events that in a process. Flowcharts are also called process, uh, process charts, and, uh, and I think it gives a, gives a good idea of what happens when information and materials flows through the process. So as I mentioned in the objectives, um, there are four basic symbols to drawing a flowchart. Now, if you can get flowchart software uh, like Visio and so on, there are dozens and dozens of uh, different types of shapes. But to draw a flowchart, you, you need a minimum of these four symbols. So on the left hand side, um, we have the uh, ellipsed shape here, and that indicates the start and the end of the process. Then there is a little box here which identifies the, or rectangle should I say, identifies the steps or the tasks that are in a process. The diamond shaped uh, box here, this represents a decision. So when something comes up, we have to decide whether we go one direction or another, we use a decision box like this. And finally, arrows are used to indicate the flow of control. So these four basic shapes should be enough to get us to draw the simplest of flow charts. So let's look at a very, very simple example to illustrate how this works. And then we'll go on and look at a, a more complicated example. So this one here is a process that, that I, I want to go out for dinner. And so um, do I have enough money to go out? And really the decision is about if I have 50 euro or $50 uh, or more, I have enough money to go out. But if I have less than 50 euro or $50, then I don't have enough money to go out and I, and I have to stay in. So let's use the flowchart uh, process here to document this. I mentioned, first of all, that we use the start uh, and end symbol. So we're going to have a start at the beginning here, the start of the process of me making the decision to whether I want to go out or not. 
And of course, the first thing I must do, the first step in, the, in this process is I need to count how much money I've got. And then becomes, there's the question then in the decision uh, box, in diamond shaped decision box. The question is, do, do you have more than 50 euro? If the answer is yes, I can go out and then perhaps go back in again and another time and count the money again and see, can I go out a second or a third time? But if the answer is no, I don't have enough money to go out. And the next step in the process is we stay in. So this decision box has a yes or no answer. And after we stay in, the process ends. I'm not going out at all. So this is a simple way of illustrating how they work. And you can see there are just four symbols being used. The start and end symbol, one at the start and one down here at the end. This is the ellipse. We have the rectangle representing a step in the process. And we've got three of those. One, two, three of them in our chart here. We've got one decision uh, box, okay, which is the diamond shape. And we've got several arrows uh, indicating the flow in the process. So hopefully that gives you a little idea about how this might work. So what are the guidelines for drawing a flowchart? I've still got the same flowchart over here on the right hand side. We've, it's, flowcharts describe the process to be charted, so uh, we want we have a description to go with this. We start with a trigger event, so our start, I and mean, the first thing we do in our example here is we count our money. The usual direction of a process is from left to right or top to bottom, and you can see I'm going for top, from top to bottom. The only reason I'm doing that is to make space here for some bullet points on the slide. And only one flow line should come out from a process symbol. So you can see process count your money, there's only one arrow coming out. The process go out, there's only one arrow coming out. And the process stay in, there's only one arrow coming out. Only one flow line should enter a decision symbol. We can see our, our decision symbol here in the center has got three arrows, one coming in and two going out, one for yes and one for no. Only one flow line is used in conjunction with a terminal symbol. So this terminal symbol here has only one flow line with it. Uh, if there, uh, there can be, well, there can only be one start symbol. There can be more than one end symbol, uh, in which case they would be located elsewhere on the diagram. Ensure that the flow chart has a logical start and a logical finish, as I think I have on this simple example here. And follow the process through to a useful conclusion. So here I can get a visual uh, indication of how information, in this case here, flows through my uh, decision-making process of whether I can go out or not. So let's take a look at a little bit more complicated example. And I, sh I will have a copy of, a larger copy of this available as a document, as an extra resource to go with this lesson. Check your uh, curriculum Udemy page for that. So this one here is about a, cost, a fictitious customer support line that I'm, I have come up with to illustrate uh, where some problems might be occurring. So it should be a relatively straightforward process, but let's say we're having difficulties here. There's complaints or problems are not being solved enough. And so we're going to take a look at the process and see if there's opportunities for improvement in here. So first of all, let's go through it. We have a logical start. We begin, it's a customer support line uh, in, in uh, let's say this is in your organization and um, somebody on a different floor perhaps calls with a query and they enter into a phone queue. Now, sometimes, as you know yourselves, um, most of us will have been in phone queues before, uh, sometimes we continue and sometimes we hang up. So the first decision is, does the customer stay in the queue? Do they hang up? And if the answer is yes, then we don't have a process here. We don't have a rectangle or an end symbol here to indicate what happens. We're just not capturing any information. So that's one potential area for improvement. Like For example, we might like to capture how long somebody has been queuing for. But if they, didn't, if they don't hang up, it continues on. And we've got two, pro two steps in it here. The first step is the process starts with a junior CSR, that's a customer support representative, and a junior person is the first person to answer the call. And then if they understand that, so the next decision here is, do they understand the problem? If they do, yes. They, the next is, is decision is, can they solve the problem over the phone? If the answer is yes, you can see it jumps right down to almost the end. And is the customer satisfied? If the answer is yes, we close the call and the process finishes. You can see here at the customer satisfied section here, if the customer is not satisfied, um, we're not doing anything. We're not restarting it. We're not going back to the beginning. Uh, nothing happens. So there's a second potential area for improvement. Now let's go back up to the uh, junior customer support representative understanding the problem. If the answer is no in this case, it's escalated to a senior CSR, customer support representative. And then we ask the same questions. Does the senior CSR understand the problem? If they do, and the answer is yes, can they solve the problem over the phone? If the answer is yes, 
we jump down to the next decision here, which is, is the customer satisfied? If they are, we close the call and the process ends. Same as before, if the customer is not satisfied, we're still not capturing the information here. Now, suppose the um, senior CSR uh, says no to understanding the problem. The next thing they'll do is they will offer to visit, send a technician uh, to the customer to see if they can go and fix it. So you can imagine somebody going from the IT support department uh, to down another floor or to another building in your organization. So we offer a visit from the technician, and if they accept that visit from the technician, uh, um, um, the uh, technician arranges a visit and they will independently um, fix the problem there. That's a, that'll be the results for a separate flow chart. Is the customer satisfied? If yes, the call is closed and the process ends. And once again, if the customer is not satisfied, we're still not capturing the information. But you can also see here there's another problem, a third problem. If an uh, offer, uh, a, a visit from a technician is not accepted by the customer, then nothing happens, okay? And we're not capturing any of the information here. So in this particular instance, in this fictitious customer support line, we've got three potential areas, one in the red question mark up at the top, one in the center here, and then one down near the bottom. So perhaps identifying those areas using this flowchart uh, shows up areas for process improvement. And then once we have done that, then we can investigate possible solutions to improve the quality of service. So some further analysis, once you have done this, might be helpful. For example, a Pareto analysis, the subject of one of our previous lessons, might give us more information about which types of calls are most common. Staffing levels could be an issue for the organization. And perhaps capacity planning, the number of people on the support line at any particular time, will help us determine the appropriate staffing, appropriate staffing levels for the customer support line. So pause the video here um, to get a, um, uh, spend some time working your way through this process or flowchart here and try and understand how information is flowing through it and what happens when the different decisions are made. So pause the video now if you'd like to examine that for a while. So once you've uh, reviewed the flowchart, hopefully you will be able to draw a flowchart of your own. And in our assignment for this lesson here, which will be coming up um, next, uh, this is about um, our job advertising. And um, the bullet points are, are listed here. I won't go through them all um, in this. I will go through them all in the assignment. Uh, vacancies are advertised in local newspapers and a company website as they arrive, and the HR department deals with this. Each application is forwarded to a manager. And you can read down through here the steps that happen um, for when a job application or a job advertisement or when the candidate uh, is invited for interview and so on. So I'd like you to draw, draw a flow chart using only the four basic symbols uh, to represent this system here. And this is the information I want you to use in the flow chart. And uh, let's see how you get on. So more details on this in the assignment. So in summary, flow charts can illustrate the sequence of operations to be performed to get to the solution of a problem. So that makes it a very powerful problem solving tool. It's very effective in determining how a process works prior to this improvement. We only need four basic symbols to create a, a basic flowchart. And of course, once you get the hang of flowcharts, maybe then you could go on to learn how to use other symbols in a flowchart. Flowcharts show up areas for process improvement, as we've seen in our previous example. And finally, we can investigate possible solutions to improve quality of service using a flowchart. We can also use it for improving uh, lots of other processes as well. So that's how uh, flowcharts are used in the problem solving um, process. I hope you found this video useful.